Hello everyone, this is Hubert Trachvalski from Neton. It is my tremendous pleasure to invite you to the next episode, namely number nine of our exchange podcast. And I'm super excited about today's topic. We are going to uh, share our perspectives and, and bring some difficult and hopefully relevant questions associated with frictionless checkouts. And I couldn't be more happy because uh, I will be sharing this next 25 minutes or so with a true expert in this domain, Michael Egan, who is currently heading payments at Bing.com. And um, I would like to, Michael, it's great to have you here with us. Uh, maybe you would like to start with a few words of introduction to make sure that our guests, our listeners, our audience knows what you are up to and what's your perspective on payments. Great, Hubert. Thanks very much for having me here today. It's uh, it's brilliant to be part of this experience. I've listened to a few of these um, podcasts already, and they're very interesting. I find them very useful. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I am the head of payments with uh, Ding.com. So Ding is the number one international mobile top-up platform in the in the world. Um, we operate a, a B2C platform and a, and a B2B to business platform as well. Um, we've been in business over 15 years at this stage. Uh, we provide a typical customer to us would online would be might be an, an immigrant who is just uh, wants to connect with their loved ones back home, and they log on to our service uh, and they can purchase uh, mobile phone credit via their the local operator back home uh, via our service. We're available in over almost 150 countries now. Uh, we are connected to almost uh, 600 uh, operators globally, or side carriers. Um, and we, we most recently have uh, invited investment into the business. So we're, we're, we're growing, growing and growing. Uh, about myself, I've been with Ding for about 10 years now. My background would be in banking, a little bit of experience in gaming, and uh, obviously within the telecoms industry now. Thank you for, for, for this introduction and, and, and huge congrats on welcoming some, some investors and, and all the growth. Uh, as you all have heard, how, uh, it's over 600 operators globally, that must be millions of users. So thinking about frictionless checkout, meeting the need and welcoming payments from so many different users, uh, that creates a lot of experience that, that we want to all benefit from. Uh, during this call. And uh, maybe before we dive right into the frictionless uh, check and what it actually means, uh, it would be useful given the times we all live in to, to start with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, and just to just to ask uh, Michael, given that you're an important voice within the payment space, have you been coming to uh, any brick and mortar events or you are still uh, shaping the future of payments online uh, from behind your keyboard currently. So uh, what was your perspective uh, for the last few months? Has anything changed? Well, it, it's starting to change here now. We're starting to see it, Hubert. We're starting to see, um, you know, more and more in-person events, uh, you know, with money 2020 there recently. Um, I, unfortunately, I was unable to travel to the Merchant Risk Council uh, Vegas conference. Um, we're, we're not currently per permitted to enter the US just yet. Uh, I'm a board member on the European Advisory Board with the Merchant Risk Council. I was hoping to reconnect with people once again. Um, that in-person touch, you really, you, you, that face-to-face -face interaction, you really can't substitute for that. Uh, I look forward to it now. Um, I look forward to the opening up of restrictions and, and getting back to, to life as normal again. How about you, Hubert? Have you had uh, the opportunity to step out there just yet? Uh, yes, indeed. Actually, la just last week, you mentioned 2020. Uh, that was a great occasion to see all of the energy happening also in a brick and mortar uh, universe or the spectrum of the universe. Uh, it, it, is, it is really interesting to see all the growth that is happening without the physical interaction between between partners, between companies, between technology providers, but also between users. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, to move a little bit towards, quite clearly, we've all been seeing a lot of growth 
the volumes of transactions are are are, are continuing to to grow very quickly online. Uh, but given the pandemic, there are probably quite a few observations uh, we are able to draw regarding the habits of users. Maybe before we dive into what a frictionless checkout is, actually, it would be interesting to to concentrate on what has been changing in terms of how users want to interact with online platforms uh, that allow them to, to transact with others. Um, maybe it would be a good starting point. What do you think? Yeah, it, it it certainly a lot has changed over the last 18 months to two years. You know, if you consider, you know, our business, you know, where typically, you, as I mentioned earlier, you might have a, an immigrant who's working abroad and wants to connect with somebody back home. Um, when the restrictions came in as a result of the pandemic and they were locked down, uh, a lot of potential customers who may have gone to the local store to purchase prepaid mobile phone credit, um, they were no longer able to do that. So they were, through our service, we were able to provide them that opportunity online so they could log on to our service, uh, select the operator that they wish to top up in which, whichever country they wanted to top up. Um, and we made that a lot more <laughs> easier and seamless for them to do that. So as a result of the pandemic, um, we, we grew our business. So we did. Um, and what we've seen, I think, you know, anecdotally, a lot of the, um, even the payment service providers, the industry will, the feedback that's coming back from them, the growth that they've seen in e-commerce has been phenomenal. Uh, and with that growth, you know, we, 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 experience new problems, I suppose, new challenges or, or, or even new types of customers enter the uh, the payments industry. So I suppose they, they introduce new challenges um, in terms of, I guess, how uh, people have been interacting with, with our service. We, we introduced uh, Apple Pay and, and GPay to our checkout. So we did in recent years and they we've seen phenomenal success with them we've seen growth in that why because uh, the likes of these um, these digital wallets they they make things a lot more easier for customers they make it easier for customers to pay um and i think i suppose as we consider today's topic which is around the frictionless checkout that would probably be um you know one of the examples of where you know, introducing an, a new payment method or relatively new. It's been around for a few years, but it's um, no doubt seen um, the same level of growth that we've seen through the pandemic, um, where where we make it so much easier for people to pay. I, I remember the first time my, my CFO, he paid with Apple. Uh, he was so excited with Apple Pay. He, he just said, I, all I had to do was just, you know, put my thumb on it and it was paid. So, these uh, these new digital wallets certainly are making the the checkout experience a lot better for our customers. Thanks for sharing this. I, actually, like this is for me the essence of why user experience is so so important. What do end user actually expect from the platform? And I, and and back to pandemic, for just just for one last second, because it seems that there was a significant number of users that because of convenience preference, they before pandemic also chose to do. Uh, transact with your platform online. So this is, let's say, we can group this them as one cohort. But uh, I pro probably you can build a hypothesis around the fact that all the users that were forced to go online uh, because the nearby store, as you mentioned, was simply closed. So they were uh, pushed online because of the situational context. Uh, do you perceive any differences in, in expectation towards um, experience on your platform, especially associated with checkout uh, between, let's say, the experienced online users that that have been doing it also before pandemic and the new cohorts of users that are still, let's say, learning how to how to shop online and how to deal with payments online. Brilliant question. Um, you know, that type of data is is very difficult to to gather. So it is um, uh, in terms of, you know, how do you compare um, the user experience and expectations of an existing customer from one period to new customers, you know, and what their expectations are. But I think what we've seen in, in general in recent years is mobile experience is very, is key to your business. You know, having, having an app, you know, that something that 
uh, that customer has on your phone that can connect you directly um, is important in in being able to connect with those customers. But um, I, I think mobile is key, and a lot of these new customers are coming to us, you know, maybe through a, a mobile browser, and then you know, um, adopting our our app as a result of that. So I, I read there somewhere recently that um, is it over a third of uh, U.S. customers, uh, e-commerce customers, are now mobile-based, you know. So I think the experience that customers are expecting there is they, they want that mobile experience. So, um, you know, they may come to you through web, through advertising on, on the web, but uh, ultimately, you know, mobile is something that they have with them uh, on a 24-hour basis nearly now. It's just beside the bed when you when you go to sleep. It's there when you wake up. So mobile experience, the reference to your question, the expectation is that um, you have a very slick, seamless mobile experience. Thanks. Thanks for sharing this. This is this is indeed true. And, and the problem associated with really understanding these different uh, backgrounds, let's say, from the perspective of online shopping experience uh, among users, uh, it is very difficult to create this unified frictionless experience because frictionless, it's, it's also a relative term for someone. A little bit of friction will be frictionless and for a very let's say, a restrictive user, it will not be frictionless at all. So uh, maybe um, um, what does this ideal case, the ideal solution entail? Because at least from our understanding, part of friction that is generated is actually conducted because of the security implications, security issues that we need to take into consideration as an online platform that is accepting payments. And at the same time, even if there was a technology that would be able to offer a frictionless experience, some of the user cohorts could feel unsafe because they do not expect typical security checks. So, uh, do you do you have any thoughts around this? Is there is there a good balance, or this is still something that that you just need to, as a platform, experiment and understand your your users, who your buyer is, and how much security they want to see there? How much is it all about quick uh, time to purchase? Uh, let's say user journey. Do you have uh, any comments on this? It's a really, really good point because um, you know, understanding your customers, as you said there, that that is key. You know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're available in over 150 countries worldwide. Um, I'm based out of Ireland, so I am. I understand the Irish consumer, my own buying experience and buying habits, what payment methods are available to me. Um, what other apps are how they are performing so um i all these apps are all these services that i use on a daily basis great brilliant but what does that shopping experience look like from somebody in the us in asia in russia in the caribbean these are all um, very different expectations and it's so important to understand the customer's needs in that regard um, I think I've, I had mentioned previously uh, before, I think when we, we had discussed uh, um, around customer experiences that um, we had been contacted from customers within the Middle East where we had not uh, enabled uh, 3D Secure uh, for a, a particular cohort of customers. And they were complaining to us because the expectation there is that they expected to get the, the one-time pa- password. And when they didn't see that, they were like, well, we believe that your your service might not be secure. So that that is just demonstrated to me that, you know, in the effort or in our effort to make that customer journey as frictionless as possible, we actually, we're nearly turning away customers because the expectation is there is for more uh, friction. Um, and I know that it's been said back to me in terms of other countries worldwide, like uh, I believe Korea as well. They expect a certain amount of friction within that journey. That is the user experience that. And if you don't have it, then your your service is deemed to be less secure than any services out there. Another important factor in understanding the user experience is that perhaps um, Internet speeds might not necessarily be up to uh, 
uh, scratch in some areas. And we can see it in areas of the Caribbean where we can see that, you know, page load speeds are so much lower there. So if you're trying to, to load uh, an application that's very heavy or very uh, bloated, um, that the user themselves, they might be well aware of their, their, their broadband capabilities or their, their connection capabilities, and the expectation is, is that they'll have to wait. But if you add more and more friction on top of that, how much longer do they have to wait? And are they just going to turn away from your service and go to the competitor that has made it a lot more seamless for them to get from A to B or down the happy path as soon as possible? So to your point, it was a really good one, and you probably see it on, on, on your side as well. User experiences are, are, and understanding the, the customer in the various geographical regions and how they uh, expect to be able to interact with the product is so important. I completely agree. Thanks thanks for sharing this example from Middle East. We've also seen it in some other geographies, especially in Latin America especially for a particular type of purchases, higher average transaction ticket purchases, there was an expectation to actually undergo a certain friction, which might be completely counterintuitive because if we would be chatting now with a UX designer, they would be saying, why to create steps that are just uh, uh, an obstacle, theoretical obstacle uh, uh, standing in between the user and and making the the payment. But this is very true. Another... um, Angle, because you mentioned PSD2 and SCA, and definitely I would like to dive into this in, in a short moment, but bef- before I for- forget, uh, because actually what you mentioned inspired me to an additional question. You at the very beginning mentioned that one way, well, like one aspect of, of, let's say, making sure that the expectation of user and, and, and the experience is better and better is about introducing more, more localized payment methods so that the choice of of, of, of let's say how someone is able to uh, use the assets that they have and they can have them in s- several different forms. It's also very important so that we don't lose a user because of the fact that we are not a- able to accept their uh, a particular form of assets. So the question is because uh, I've been also following quite a few studies that actually too much choice and some of the payment gateway widgets are actually becoming very heavy in terms of how much choice there is. And, and my hypothesis would be that in some situation, it might actually generate an additional friction. Like if you give too much choice uh, to a user and they can choose to have a split payment, bank transfer, credit card, maybe buy now, pay later offering, and, so, and a lot of other options, they might actually pause on this because then they need to rethink the purchase from a dimension how I want to use my money. And, and, and actually the friction might be counterproductive from a perspective of, of boosting sales. I wanted to ask whether you have any experiences experimenting with, let's say, the order of payment methods that you display or, or actually having a subset of methods, knowing where the user is coming from or maybe which offer they are adding to cart as they go through, through your platform. Like, Do you try to work on, on making the experience more frictionless or less with less friction uh, by uh, by playing with the payment offer that is there. Uh, short answer is yes, <laughs> we do. We we do play around with that a lot. And I suppose Western uh, payment method, uh, our established payment method, it's so important to have the ability to be able to store cards, you know, and so that when a user comes back to your service again that um, you're able to obviously be being able to authenticate them uh, very seamlessly, but you're also able to present them with their preferred method of payment. That said, um, I know we touched on it earlier, I, I'm based in Ireland, it's very hard to understand, well, what's the preferred payment method of somebody, as you mentioned, maybe in, in Latin America? So if you take, for instance, uh, Brazil, Right, so we have on our B2B checkout there, we have a Boleto there. So if you t- take somebody who's used of the culture around a Boleto, um, the installment payment factor of it, you know, which uh, um, I know we, we'd spoken pre- a number of months back on buy now, pay later. If you think of what buy now, pay later was, so buy now, pay later, the, 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 the phenomenon that it is now, that's no different to how a Brazilian customer would have paid for a Boleto in the past. They pay in installments, so they would. So if you 
um, if you had maybe a Brazilian customer who is based maybe in Ireland now and they log on to the Irish checkout uh, and they might see, well, oh, hold on, where where is my equivalent to to Valetto? You know, oh, oh here here we have like in Ireland we have Hum, you know, which is a buy now pay later, you know, for a lot of physical goods. So you know. Once they see that, it's like, oh yeah, now I can pay in installments. Or that same customer might come to a checker and says, you know, contact your customer support and say, well, how can I pay in installments for this? So understanding how the customer wants to pay and understanding your customers is key to a lot of this, obviously. Um, and uh, we do a little bit of work around our checkout, ensuring that, you know, that that payment method that they have selected from the start is always there for them when they come back in, when they're returning again. Uh, in addition to that, I suppose we have, uh, you mentioned PSD2. Um, part of the uh, PSD2 directive was the introduction of open banking and, and opening up the bank APIs. Uh, if you think of um, payment methods like Ideal in Holland, um, or even Klarna, uh, as, as it was, so forth in Germany, this was very much a the the, the open banking um, product that we would all like to see. But various different customers in the various different geographies, you know, I might expect to pay differently with my bank account as a person with maybe ING in, in Holland might. So the, I suppose the challenge that we're going to see in relation to checkouts and open banking going forward is, you know, is there going to be one ideal for Europe? Or, or, and then what is that going to look like in the US or what is it going to look like in, in various other different geographies? And then if somebody is paying with their, with their bank account, tra- paying through open banking under PSD2 in Europe, when they go to the States, that method is no longer there for them, you know? So I think the challenge for payments community going forward, if they want to develop open banking is to be able to think about those and how we're going to make it uh, as seamless for for the customer going forward, you know. Yes, uh, I I totally agree, and especially I I believe during Money Twenty there was a report released or around around the event uh, that over twenty jurisdictions are working on their own implementation and infrastructure for open banking payments uh, stretching throughout the globe. So that would be very exciting to see more of of what we've been seeing in Europe for, for a while, but, or we are seeing in Brazil with PIX, and uh, and some other jurisdictions are also quite advanced, but like seeing how uh, Middle East will solve this problem, how, how it is going to fly in India, how is it going to work in Singapore, and it's like different jurisdictions, completely different behavioral expectations of users, and then the big challenge, can we unify it somehow? Because maybe I would like to buy something from a merchant, with my European bank account, uh, not like who will build the rails or will we be able to establish rails for for great payment experience in between these regions and the systems? It presents another challenge, doesn't it, as well? Like, you know, that um, you are you introducing more friction at the checkout then in terms of the, the, the existing customer's behavior? So if I'm paying with my card now um, and I've just made it, I've you know, the, the, the merchant is storing my card details. I come back in or maybe I'm on a subscription. So it's just so seamless with my card. How do you convert that customer over to open banking? And, you know, why? OK, for the merchants, you might say, well, it's cheaper. But then for the customer, there's no benefit as such. So we need to think about that then. What is going to be how do you incentivize a customer who is who's paying with cards to pay for something, the same product? With a different payment method that is adding more friction, potentially, um, but they don't get any benefit from. So that's going to be the challenge going forward in in that regard. And and it, it comes back to you know our question of friction. You know, is introducing these new payment methods is it introducing unnecessary friction, or like we already mentioned, is this friction expected? Like we, like we, the example I get from the Middle East, where, where, you know, we're taking them from the one-time password into maybe two-factor authentication now, so that's going to be expected. So that's how they they'll they will pay and they'll have no problem paying that way. But when you introduce somebody uh, to open banking now, 
potentially, um, and they're paying with card already, you're maybe you're introducing too much friction at the checkout. So that's going to be a, a challenge for uh, open banking, I think, as a payment method going forward. Yeah, and to, to make it even more exciting, at least for me personally, is that we are designing or we are talking about what will happen in the next five, ten years, but we are representing a particular, let's say, cohort of users. We know how to, we are banked in a certain way, like you are in Ireland, I'm in Poland, so there are certain differences, but let's say we, we know what a visa world looks like. Uh, we know what it means to uh, to be forced to generate the chargeback with your issuing bank. Like, but the question is how how the preferences and expectations of all of them, the millennials, but but also going further, Generation Z and whatever uh, Z or letters of alphabet we will be creating for, for these exciting new cohorts and how they will want to uh, interact with their resources. And, 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 and these preferences will probably have a very important voice in the discussion because we can, we, we can devise something that seems uh, reasonable, but then uh, I often uh, catch myself uh, taking a look at some of these apps that are very popular and like booming in popularity among certain user cohorts. And, and I honestly don't not, do not get how can you spend so much time there. And but, but this is the reality. You can you can oppose it, but but you cannot ignore it. Like as long as you want to be part of an important discussion. So uh, that will be super exciting because maybe it it will require a significant uh, switch of mindset in terms of. Uh, what kind of experience should be there? Uh, one last, uh, or maybe not last, but uh, one additional topic is also the question of how we let, by eliminating friction, we also create a, a larger portion of transaction that are generated by by apps or devices that are used by several people. Like I'm thinking about uh, tablets um, owned by parents and are and being used by children. And then there is a question of all this in-app purchases and what can happen within while interacting without some additional, let's say, step before a particular transaction is happening. And we've been hearing a lot of a challenge associated who is actually the user. Okay, the device might be logged in. It is authenticated in a particular way. Payment methods are, are, are being stored for convenience, for better frictionless experience of the parents. But then there is someone else. I'm not saying with bad intentions, but simply uh, interacting with this. And there is a, uh, without any additional second step or someone raising a flag, okay, the, tr- the money is going to be transferred from point A to B. Uh, how, how do you deal with this to make it okay? Because obviously one answer could be everyone should have their own tablet and, and children should have their own payment methods. But there is a big community of saying that this is probably not necessarily immediate from very young age. So. Uh, do you have any thoughts around this friction that is serving an additional purpose uh, and can guard uh, situations that are uh, potentially risky or, or simply unwanted by users? I always start uh, in situations like this with the question, what's the problem we're trying to solve? So I guess what you're referring to there is that, you know, what do, from a merchant perspective, what do we end up with as a result of this? So we end up with first party fraud, right? Because, you know, you have somebody who says that, well, I didn't authorize this transaction and this is, this wasn't me, even though it may have been, as you said, it may have been a minor, may have been somebody else that is authorized on the particular device and that. Um, from our perspective, from Ding, we don't see that as a, you know, as a major challenge. I think a lot of the, the gaming companies out there, um, do see that as a, as a huge challenge right now. Um, and they are dealing with it in different ways. There are many different ways to do it. And, um, I see a lot of innovation as well in, in that space in that you're seeing the rise of a lot of the neo banks being able to offer, um, card services or virtual card services to, uh, to minors. So by, by being able to allocate a prepaid balance maybe onto this, that you uh, eliminate the the uh, growing risk of maybe hundreds and hundreds of, of dollars or euros or whatever it is in chargebacks as a result of that. So um, I can, you know, th- these are 
um, I would say problems that are arising in various different sections that people are solving in various different methods. So being able to um, use your data as best you can, you know, to be able to identify, well, this is the this is the uh, the user, you know, and if it is the user, does the owner of that device hold that device in a certain way, right? And does the miner that also has shared use of that device, do they hold it in a different manner as well? So that, you know, you're able to detect very seamlessly through the device data that, well, hold on, this is not the owner of the device, but, you know, this is a user of, acknowledged user of the device. So using our data, what data we have on on those devices to be able to differentiate between them and then maybe popping up a flag that says, please authorize or please authenticate, you know, the, this service. So I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, it is a problem that a lot of merchants out there are trying to solve. They're solving it in different ways and there are different methods of solving it. But um, I think by looking to the data that we have out there um, and being able to authenticate those uh, those genuine customers really uh, and also being able to eliminate that risk of first party fraud um, through the use of data is, is important. Yeah, um, it sounds very compelling. Uh, thanks for sharing. I, this is actually a very powerful framework for uh, thinking about various problems across payment risk broad spectrum, like what is actually the, the main underlying problem and, and, and starting off from there. Uh, we need, we need to probably also spend the last few minutes on the topic of SCA. Uh, so we, we mentioned PSD2 and the strong customer authentication and that's especially, uh, what it means for friction. We are at a very particular stage because as we know, probably the way the rails are implemented in all necessary connections are not yet there where they should be or could be. So that, that is creating some additional. Uh, um, issues, but I just wanted to ask your comments as someone who is running the payment pipes for, for a major institution that is also operating in Europe, significant operations, like any, any comments, suggestions, hints that you could say, uh, or share with our audience who might be in a similar situation or maybe might be running smaller institutions or they are just entering Europe. Uh, from that on perspective, what we've been seeing is, uh, is actually a lot of demand for diving deeper into the topic of TRA exemptions, so transaction risk assessment, as a way to try to fight conversion loss when it should be lower, or at least there's an expectation should be lower. So we are running a few exercises on this. It will be great to hear your perspective where we are today, uh, end of September 2021. What's your state of mind regarding SCA adoption? Um, I think that the topic itself really, it joins the dots on a lot of what we've spoken already today. So we've spoken about user experience. So what's the user experience across, um, across Europe right now? You know, with the introduction of PSD2 and SCA since the start of the year. And how is that different from country to country across Europe as more and more countries start to increase the the level of enforcement on the directive um and we have we, we have experienced the pain of that our customers are experiencing the pain of that and then outside of just even europe then what's the user experience then in the rest of the world like we know that next month now mastercard will be rescinding even more support for 3d secure 1.0 uh, and as of October of next year, we'll be deprecating it. So how are issuers, uh, financial institutions across the globe then going to handle that? How is each one of those financial institutions going to, int- uh, going to issue that friction when they have to at the checkout? What does that look like? How do we as merchants understand uh, how do we know even what that's going to look like for each one of our customers that are part of these financial institutions? I think in, in Germany alone, there's over 2,000 2, um, financial institutions or banks there, licensed banks. So um, it is becoming increasingly diff- difficult because the user experience in one country is, and even with, with 
different banks within the same country can be different across the board. So I think we need to rethink authentication. We need to, uh, I know we've, we've mentioned in joining the dots, what we've already spoken about, we've, we've spoken about a seamless checkout. Well, what does that seamless checkout look like? Uh, as in, do we authenticate our, our customers in the same way Apple Pay or Google Pay authenticate? So, so that when they come to the checkout, that it's just a case of, as in my CFO, putting his thumbprint on it and it's just seamless authentication. So how do we, uh, are, are we going, um, the question I suppose I would issue is that are we going to see more and more adoption of that in terms of cryptograms being passed for authentication um, and subsequent authorization? Is that more a more seamless experience for our customers um, than the issuing, allowing the banks to be able to issue that friction and not knowing what that's going to look like? Um, so I think it presents a lot of opportunity right now. In particular, the opportunity that I see out there is around delegated authentication. So whereby, you know, you, you are authenticating the customer yourself within your own app, which it could be, as I said, it could be a cryptogram. It could be, you know, it could be biometrics. It could be that those two factors of authentication are captured within your own web, and this is joining the, back, the, the dots back to what the user expectation is now. We're seeing more and more people uh, adopting mobile uh, as opposed to web clients. So um, join, in, in joining the dots there, we're saying, well, if they are using the mobile, then can we use the device ID? Can we use these, um, and joining the dots once again back to our data, can we use the data to be able to more seamlessly authenticate um, our, our customers um, and to be able to separate the, the, the good actors from the bad actors. So I, there's a huge problem out there, certainly. The introduction um, of uh, SCA, I certainly do in, in, endorse it. I, t I do think that we do need uh, better authentication. Better authentication will lead to uh, improved authorizations, it'll lead to better customers, it'll lead to increased retention, so it will have that customer and an overall better experience. I'm not 100% certain that we have got the uh, solution right. We certainly know what the problem is that we're trying to solve, um, but I think we could probably do better in terms of the solution. Um, and I do foresee that, you know, the likes, uh, as I mentioned, the likes of delegated authentication or, you know, in-app authentication being used in substitute to what the, the, the banks issue in our friction in that regard would be a better solution. I think there's a lot of work being done in that area at the moment. Uh, I think even the, the likes of Net, NetOn, they can, they can offer a lot of uh, uh, insight into how to better perform that as well. well what's your thoughts on it, Hubert? Yeah, uh, I, I, I believe in most cases, I completely agree. Uh, uh, for me, or for us, uh, the way we see world, actually, what is happening with SCA adoption and what will be the outcome of it, what will be the perception of the merchants, of the financial ecosystem as a community of professionals, as end users, finally, will accelerate a, a much broader uh, transformation in terms of authentication. I, I, I totally agree that delegated and allowing for parties to conduct part of this flow is in line with what we see in terms of decentralizing a lot of processes. Uh, we don't have time to go into crypto and I would love to ask you about what do you believe in on-ramping as a way of bridging fiat to, um, fiat to crypto as a way of using it within the frictionless checkout, maybe next time. But uh, I totally agree that there are technical ways of, of, of understanding user better and keeping this authentication as light as possible from the user experience perspective. And then as long as you are able to assign and maintain a certain degree of trust towards a particular digital identity and share it in a decentralized way across platforms, uh, that could be a very forward-looking way of, 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 of solving the, um, the issue. But the secu security will be there, and hopefully also preferences of the users will be towards allowing to extract certain data points that are not invasive, 
uh, but they provide a certain degree of confidence that we are dealing with the same user, not just the same or spoofed device ID that that, that, that a particular vendor was was processing. So uh, very powerful point, uh, uh, Michael. I believe we are running out of time or have run out of time. As always, a huge pleasure uh, speaking with you and, and learning from your insights and experience. Uh, I am confident on behalf of our audience and all the listeners that uh, that, that was a time well spent on their part and that triggered some thought processes that they will be continuing on. And, and this is actually the purpose of this of this call. So it's uh, also personally a great pleasure to have you with me and, and sharing these thoughts. Uh, and uh, and I hope it was also somewhat, uh, somewhat pleasant for you. Uh, thanks a lot for this. The pleasure was all mine, Hubert. I really enjoy our conversation, so I do. And I look forward to the next conversation on crypto. <laughs> I do already. Um, uh, it's been a very, very interesting conversation. And um, I think there's a lot more that can be teased out of this uh, in the future as well. Definitely. Uh, I will keep everyone posted on the next uh, ideas that sprout out of this very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for listening uh, and uh, looking forward to having you in our episode 10. Thank you very much too.